Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to have you all here. Thank you so much for joining us for today for the webinar on cybersecurity in supply chain, start with prevention. I'm your host for tonight, and we are almost starting the, our roundtable on the topic today. As we all know, we live in a digital era right now and supply chains are becoming increasingly dynamic and complex with multiple vendors, suppliers, and parts involved. The complexity brings an increased risk of cybersecurity threats, which can severe, have severe consequences on the overall supply chain and business operations, and can impact our daily to daily lives as a society. In this event, we will discuss about the best practices and strategies for preventing cyber attacks in the supply chain. And we will focus on our on four main themes. Before we go there, uh, please drop a like if you are watching us from YouTube or LinkedIn uh, and feel free to comment. We will have a question and answer session in the end where you can also uh, put your questions to our uh, speakers. Um, so don't be shy, please. Uh, we can have uh, we can delay a little bit because we are I, I'm seeing everyone joining now. Uh, so let's talk about the four themes that we are going to address tonight. First one, we are going to address assessing third party risks. So we are going to to learn how we can identify risks, we can mitigate risks, and also accept some risks. We are going to see the differences between third parties. SaaS cloud solutions versus open premise, on premise, sorry. And we are going to address MSSPs and external security providers, the risks on this as well. And of course, we are going to focus on ethical hacking. And of course, I'm a little bit biased here as CEO of Etiac, but we are going to see how ethical hacking is the most cost effective solution and the, more, the better way to prevent cyber attacks. In the end, we will have this session uh, question and answer. So please, if you are watching, just drop the questions on, on the chat. We have our team to pick and select the best comments uh, and questions. And we are going to ask our speakers to answer them before the, the close of the session. And also we are going to have a, a little bit to talk after the end of this, this the round table about FTAC and about how can our product help you um, prevent cyber attacks in the supply chain. Um, so without further delay, I think we, I can present our speakers. Uh, we will have a lot uh, of different backgrounds here. We have speakers that from different, different perspectives. We have people that manage large supply chains with thousands of providers and suppliers and people who develop systems to optimize these supply chains. So the providers and suppliers of this the supply chain management systems, let's say like this. And we also have ethical hackers. So we can also have the perspective of the person who is attacking the systems for ethical reasons, of course, uh, to identify the vulnerabilities on the systems so we can better protect them, them right? So whether you are a CEO, a CISO, a CIO, a cybersecurity professional, or even someone just connected to the supply chain that is working there, uh, I believe you can gain a lot of knowledge from today's uh, roundtable, and you can get new insights, and I hope this will be useful for you uh, and informative, but please uh, don't forget to follow us, to give us that like, give us that comment. And if you have any doubts, don't forget to, to comment on the chat. And I think we can start by presenting uh, people. So the first speaker that we have today is Rafael Carvalho. Rafael is an experienced DevOps engineer um, who enjoys working in agile developments, uh, is working now on mixed move. Uh, and is responsible for managing cloud infrastructure uh, and solution develop delivery pipeline. And Mixmove is basically a platform for logistics optimization, supply chain optimization. And so Rafael will also play the, the perspective of the supplier. Hello, Rafael. Nice to have you here. Hello. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mixmove, it's a large uh, 
software as a service company that we have a, a really large clients and we deliver uh, the, all the logistic uh, platform for these clients. And ETIAC uh, is a really valuable uh, partner of our security journey in the cloud environment. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, Mixmoop already has the ISO also implemented, so it was a long process. Uh, and we can also talk a little bit about that. I think it will be nice to, to know how you guys are dealing with that. Uh, the next speaker will be Luis. Luis Valente is a cybersecurity manager at MC Sonai. Uh, he has previously coordinated the Computer Security Center at the University of Porto for more than five years and is also guest lecturer in several university institutions such, such as ESP Gaia, ISEC, Porto Business School. Uh, so he has a lot of background in training in the cybersecurity area uh, and his background is network engineering and computer systems. Here he plays the perspective of the manager of a user organization in the retail uh, that deals every day with supply chain rights and there is multiple providers and the cyber attack could impact the daily of millions of people. Am I right, Luis? Yes, you're right, George. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon for, for today. Um, yes, MC, that uh, maybe it's more uh, usually known by continent. It's our branch of food, Sonai Group for food retail essential, but it is a, um, a company that serves more than a half, uh, um, a quarter of market in the retail food sector. And we have more than 4 million clients, for example, in our loyalty card. So uh, a, a small uh, problem in all these uh, different the warehouses process, the storage process, or the loyalty process have a huge impact for a lot of people in the market. Um, we also are um, a very innovative company. So we, we opened the first autonomous store uh, in Europe. Um, so you, you can go to the shops and buy your products, choose your products and get out of the, the store without losing time on the caches. So we are always trying to push and deal uh, with different technologies and trying to get a better user experience for our clients. Thank you, Luis. I think it's, it's on is working with a lot of solutions and I think it will be nice to talk a little bit on you guys lead with this, deal with all these, these risks, right? And the last uh, speaker will be Jose. Jose Moreira is application security analyst at Farfetch. Uh, behind, beyond his passion for information security and hacking, um, he's basically application security analyst, but I know more himself from his crazy hacking experience. Uh, he's one of the best hackers that I have the pleasure to meet. Uh, and he's basically has worked a lot as a security auditor for other companies, such as Agile InfoSec, Checkmarks, and so many others. And I think he has more vulnerabilities that I can count. So nice to have you here, Jose. And I hope you can give your perspective as an hacker to this panel. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for the, the invite. Uh, yeah, you, you bring us a really interesting topic today. Um, and for me, as I have been already in the two sides of, of this um, view that we are trying to, to discuss as an, an hacker, uh, sometimes you, um, you find some vulnerability in the third party and re you report it, and then you have the follow-up of the vulnerability with, um, with the client and you're trying to, to discuss um, the impact of this um, third party to the to the client and it's always interesting to to understand uh, how will they um, fix this vulnerability because sometimes um, it's not easy but in this point hackers always want to to fix the vulnerability because they have reported it and um, in the same uh, subject uh, also work on the other side as um, someone that is on the client and receives um, a vulnerability from the, the third party. And it's also very interesting to, to deal with this 
matter inside because our perspective changes a lot and um, in, the, in this side you're trying to, to secure your company and also you have the, um, the things that you don't see as a, as a, um, a pure hacker and you, you need to, to talk with the developers, you need to understand um, the business, the contest um, so we can, can find a, a solution that uh, could fix this third party that sometimes we can um, get a fix or not because we will depend on, on the, the third party, but it's always uh, interesting to, to deal with this. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's very interesting to have like these this both uh, uh, ways of looking to the same subject, right? So yeah, uh, thank you so much for having here and Finally, I, I will present our moderator for today, and uh, it will be Andrea Batista. Andrea Batista is the CTO of Etiac. Uh, is also an hacker, an ethical hacker. He has more than ten years' experience on ethical hacking. He's an invited professor at the University of Porto in information security, and has won multiple international awards. Some. Uh, in Portugal, call him the uh, Cristiano Ronaldo of cybersecurity. Uh, he, it's what it is, uh, and I, 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 it's really good to have you here to, to basically moderate this debate and make this, these people think a little bit more about cybersecurity and basically push them to tell us the best insights that they have in different perspectives. So without further delays, Andre, I, I, I let you uh, present this, all this uh, panel, uh, uh, the topics on make questions and I see you guys at the end and please everyone have a nice evening. Hey, so let's get started. Thank you, George, for the intros. Uh, that was really awesome. All right. So I'm very honored to be moderating today's panel. Also, uh, it's a first for me to be a moderator. I'm uh, usually on the other side. So bear with me. Um, so uh, for today, uh, so as we all know, uh, cybercrime is rising as we depend more and more on technology. Uh, so especially when we focus on supply chain, we must consider that our goods and our services depend on all of these solutions on technology. So a serious disruption can have a serious impact on society itself. Um, so it's very important to stay up to date with security and to have open and honest discussions uh, within the security community and contribute to it. So we all have a role to play um, nowadays in keeping our, our organization safe, our customers, our people, and uh, we must share this knowledge to achieve this goal all together. Uh, so I'm very excited to hear from our panelists today, and I hope that this discussion will bring some uh, knowledge to the attendees uh, to improve the security posture on their organizations towards a safer digital world. So thank you all for joining us today and let your friends know or your colleagues know that this is happening because this can have a lot of value for your organization. So... Um, Let's talk a bit about third-party software. Uh, so the third-party software is used by almost all organizations uh, today. So this type of software helps them, the organizations to be cost-effective, to reduce costs, to be scalable, and to be able to integrate those uh, solutions with their own software and systems. Um, however, introducing these solutions can potentially lead to security issues. Um, so we are not focusing right now on third-party security software related with security, but in general, okay? Uh, so uh, I would like to ask, uh, we can start uh, with uh, Luis. Luis, what do you think uh, that are the main risks associated with third parties that we are using? Uh, and of course, if you can disclose, how many times did the third party resulted in the exploitation or the identification of vulnerability in your organization. Sorry, Andre, you can repeat. Uh, of course, yes. I so, lost the connection a few minutes, seconds, sorry. No worries. So what would you say when, if I ask, what are the main risks associated with these third party vendors? And if you could disclose how many vulnerabilities have you identified 
uh, or how many vulnerabilities have resulted by because of using third parties? Yeah, um, let, 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 let's give you a vision. Um, I think that is most uh, transversal for all the companies nowadays. We almost all the software that you, we use um, in solutions, client facing. There, there are pieces that are developed by third parties. I can talk in the mobile applications that the, our clients use at home. At the, for example, the e-commerce portal that is a very no, well-known um, multinational company that support this solution um, for solutions in the warehouse, things like that. So. The software uh, suppliers are all the components of the critical chain of value uh, components that we have in the company. Um, in the hyper-connected world, on everything on, on the company needs to be uh, online uh, with uh, very short time to move goods. In our case, food that uh, have short lifetimes uh, we need to have all these pieces working well um, and it's uh, well known too that uh, the, the vulnerabilities on software uh, or the risks that are in, uh, created by third parties to the companies are one of the, the highest um, uh, risks on, on the world in uh, Europe it's uh, reported by Enisa like number one risk so uh, when we found this type of uh, vulnerabilities, um, we have a problem. Why? It's why it's a problem. It's not only the the question to have a data breach or a stop. It's it's, a, it's the, the the how we can correct this uh, vulnerability. Uh, don't taking uh, a huge impact in the business. We have some systems that cannot have. Um, huge uh, times means to, to stop. We have small windows to make all these updates and things like that. So we need to identify uh, early, um, quickly, more soon as possible, trying to identify how we can uh, mitigate the impacts of that vulnerability on the software to maintain uh, the our goal. This is the business running well and safe. Um, and yes, we, we identify this type of vulnerabilities. I cannot give you a number. <laughs> of course, yeah. Of course, yeah, I definitely agree. That's that's a, a good approach and to keep everything updated. That leads me to another question, uh, which is, and Rafael, I'd like to ask you now, um, especially on Mix Move. Um, how do you evaluate the third party risk from the solutions that you use? So what would you say that are the best practices uh, in order to assess uh, the risk that these solutions could represent to your organization? Let's say that you are using a given provider. How do you make sure that this provider can be trusted? And uh, I'd like to ask also uh, if you establish precise security requirements for these vendors, for example. Uh, yes, uh, we have some uh, security requirements uh, in order to, to comply with ISO 27001. We need to evaluate each uh, provider, each vendor that we have. And we, have, we need to classify the impact of this provider in our solution. Uh, and it's... Uh, really good because based on this impact of this uh of risk from this supplier on our solution we can uh, establish uh, different controls like uh we can do reviews regarding security uh each six months or early or as needed uh depends on the uh impact of this provider on our uh, infrastructure or on our solution. And regarding the controls and the practices, uh, we try to uh, comply with some uh, standards in the market like ISO or uh, SOC 2. Uh, they are the main ones, the, the main two uh, 
standards that we look to our uh, suppliers and uh, we try to uh, make sure that these suppliers has good uh, security behavior and we have some forms to ask them and try to do some tests uh, on the infrastructure and make sure that it will uh, uh, control the risk for us because it's always a risk, but we can control uh, sometimes and make sure that uh, if you have some breach on that the infrastructure will not affect our data. This is one uh, the, the main point here. Uh, the, 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 because this is not our data, it's our client data, and it's most important than our data. Yeah, 100%. Uh, definitely data segmentation and uh, isolating systems into different uh, segments is usually a very good countermeasure as well. So thank you for your insight, uh, Rafael. Uh, about third-party risk. Um, and let's bring it on to the other side, uh, the attackers, the ethical hackers side of things. Zezadas, or as you are known in the hacker community, uh, José, as a hacker, how many times have you exploited third-party software? Um, is it usually more secure than the organization-owned applications uh, by organization owned i mean organization built software in house um it it depends um as for a number yeah uh, i found some of this type of vulnerabilities time to times um it, it appears it's always um, a risk uh, it always happens and will be happening um a lot um as for uh, a risk but by itself um, it depends on the the context because if we are thinking um about uh, for example um open source library um sometimes people that develop that um, library do not pay any attention um, about security because maybe sometimes it's just an open source project from even the college or, or something like that. So um, on those type of third parties, um, there is almost none security at all. Um, but then um, there are some other scenarios. Um, it's, for example, buying um, a known service from a, a third party. And on, on those kind of um, services, um, yeah, of, co of course, there is um, a lot more security there than uh, on other types of third parties. So yeah, there, there could be some, some dangerous, um, um, but yeah, it, it also depends on, on the, the, the context of the, the part, third party that we are um, evaluating. Makes a lot of sense. I also agree as a ethical hacker, uh, especially the libraries um, things that, that you mentioned as well. Uh, what do you think that would be also to add to this 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 question? Uh, what would be the best countermeasure to keep all the libraries updated? In your opinion, uh, would be like to make sure that on the pipelines all of these is like checked, such as Dependabot or other solutions that come to your mind. Yeah, of, of course you, you can have software that will warn you if you have some um, software um, outdated, but we need to um, to think that sometimes there are there are vulnerabilities that are not known. Um, someone that there could be a, um, a group of people that knows about a, a vulnerability, but the rest of the world, the world doesn't know it. So sometimes, if we think like, oh, there is a, a security patch and I need to um, to do the update, so I always um, be strict to um, just the security patches. But sometimes. Uh, just by, by doing the, the regular updates, we can also prevent some unknown um, vulnerabilities. Uh, but of course, this is a, a, a complex subject because um, libraries tend to be more updated than, that, than our own code. So time to time, the libraries sta uh, start to, to change and you need to adopt your code. Um, so it, it's not totally plausible that you, you could 
uh, always be on the, the last versions of your third party. Sometimes you need so, some time even to, to test test the, the new version if nothing breaks. So um, yeah, theoretically, um, you should uh, update. And of course, we know uh, what would be the best practices, practices and the way that we, we should uh, do the, the updates. But in the real world, uh, it's not easy. And um, sometimes, um, there are no, no ways to, to update a, a specific library because we can also can be using a, a, a library that uh, is not maintained anymore. So it's even a, a bigger risk because we have something in our hands that we, we need to, to replace and replacing this uh, at the moment, uh, it's difficult. So yeah, we, we need to, to evaluate the, the risk first and then have our countermeasures. Yeah, definitely. And the legacy components that you are mentioning are usually very, very painful. I, I think that we all here have this, this pain sometimes in our organizations, of course. Um, but yeah, so you're talking about lack of updates, uh, it being uh, one of the main reasons for um, uh, the third party uh, being um, a threat to, to organizations as well, as well as libraries and so on as a conclusion for this, the first part of this uh, supply chain uh, round table. And also, of course, you, you didn't explicitly say, Jose, but also when everything else fails, we can still try to hack it and see if it's, we can get in, right? But we'll get there in the, in the end to the ethical hacking subject. Um, so, um, talking about uh, third parties, uh, there are uh, two main types, let's say, of, of third party software that we can use, if we can classify like this, but um, we rely on third party SaaS or cloud-based uh, external hosted third party by the third party itself on their infrastructure, or it could be on-prem, right? So, um, these solutions can be... Um, uh, the, the ones that can be hosted on the organization infrastructure are not usually so uh, common today. We have a lot of subscription-based, contract-based software that we can use uh, online. Uh, but there are some security implications of uh, picking uh, these, these two types, one of these two types of third-party uh, solutions, such as, uh, as an example, like Jira Cloud or Atlassian Cloud Solution or on-prem solution or GitLab or uh, lots of software that we all use, right? Um, and these are key parts of our uh, software as well. Uh, and the way we build our software and we manage our systems and our teams and even our operations, right? So I'd like to ask Luis, um, what are your uh, key considerations um, that organizations uh, should take into account when they are designing between using third-party, cloud-based third-party solutions versus on-prem solutions? Uh, what, what is the rationale here? Yeah, <clears throat> um, let me put um, from side the, the, the rationale about if we need to go to cloud or not. There are strategies in companies, and from our side, we have a strategy for cloud first uh, and, and full. Um, so in our company, we when we start a project, we know that that will be supported on cloud mainly. Um, the question here in the security perspective, I think that there are different challenges because in this moment, we are losing the control of a lot of things that we can do when there are the solutions on premises. The example is if you need to make a pen test for this software because the solution is built with different blocks of that, um, that cloud provider and we can think in the SaaS solution for a commerce platform. For example, if you, you want to verify the code that is developed by your partner to um, customize that that interfaces like our portal um, you need to address this type of evaluations with a third company you need to have their agreement 
to make that um, that assessment. You need to ensure that you have, for example, logs that you can analyze, uh, can, you can monitor the things. So in the end, you are losing a lot of control. And um, in Portugal, we don't have the, the tradition to read the small letters of the contracts with these providers. And they are so huge co comparing with us that uh, we, we struggle a lot to impose them um, the real needs to control, uh, for example, these, these components. Um, I, ca I can give you the example. Today I'm reading a, 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 a proposal of a contract of one of these biggest SaaS companies, and they're saying you can only make one assessment by year. So I just have one moment in the year to assess the vulnerabilities on my <laughs> software. <laughs> the hackers can do all the year. They don't ask. They don't have that uh, obligation in the contract. Um, so we are fighting with different tools and different rules in the same world. So we cannot protect the same way that the attackers can looking for us. So. Uh, I think that we, we have new challenges in this world. I think that we don't have yet anticipated that in the legal and compliance things. We we can have all the ISO certifications, SOC certifications. In the end, the platform can be vulnerable for uh, cross-site scripting, things like that. Um, so we can lose money. We can stop the business with things like that. Uh, and we lost a lot of capabilities to evaluate this um, for supply chain um, components. So, yeah, I don't have a magic answer to this. I'm, I'm struggling in fighting to, to improve this aware uh, in the legal teams, for example. We need more support on the legal part to, um, to, to help in these situations. Yeah, legal can be can be a pain sometimes as well. Of course, uh, we all know it. Um, but uh, you you raised the very very good uh, perspectives on on this as well in terms of control, speci especially over what's happening in these in these components and what how we can actually uh, assess that this third party solution um, would work better if it was on prem or not. Uh, sometimes. Uh, Rafael, what is your view on this? And I would like to ask uh, if you uh, test your third-party solutions as well uh, from a security perspective, perspective, if you have authorization to do it, and also your view on um, on-prem uh, uh, third-party solutions versus cloud-based external solutions. Uh, sorry, Rafael, you are muted right now. <laughs> this is <Good. laughs> always happen. Uh, well, uh, regarding uh, the test on third parties, uh, we, uh, in the security perspective, we don't have, uh, we have just one uh, supplier that we have a, uh, cloud-based solution that we are using uh, and for this supplier we yes we, we, we can uh, make some tests on specific environment uh, but it's really really uh, restrict tests uh, and yeah the, this is one uh, the most difficult parts of to deal with uh, cloud-based solutions uh, and well, and regarding closed bait solution uh, versus uh, on-prem, honestly, it depends a lot. Uh, the uh, if you have the infrastructure to to host it, and if you have the knowledge to maintain and to support the solution, this is one uh, important decision because uh, if you don't have the knowledge in uh, internally, you can struggle with security questions or even with operation questions uh, regarding uh, any platform. 
uh, the price, it's uh, the second uh, thing because uh, it's uh, today I, I can give it as a sample. We are using Elastic uh, internally, and we have an uh, we had a on-prem solution, and we migrated to a cloud-based solution uh, because the price was most attractive for us. Uh, we didn't have any security uh, reason to do that, but we uh, managed it to uh, host in a most controlled way, hosting it uh, on the same uh, cloud uh, uh, supplier that we have. And well, yeah, uh, regarding this third party tests and, and security uh, assessment, it's uh, really difficult. Like you cannot uh, apply to a test on Azure. Uh, you can test just your own uh, infrastructure. We have some controls most regarding uh, disaster recovery and these things. But one uh, strategy that we have, it's try to maintain an uh, active monitoring on not just on our systems, but on our suppliers too, to uh, try to understand if you are secure and if you have some issues or, or data breaches and everything else. Thank you, Rafael, from your insights on this. So um, these, these two solutions, I, I definitely agree. Um, the decision on whether to use these cloud-based solutions or on-prem solutions will depend on specific needs and context of some situations and also priorities for the, the organization. There are drawbacks uh, on, on multiple uh, options, but there is no doubt in terms of data security that uh, organizations uh, that want to maintain control over their data, especially critical data, um, it's usually a better idea to uh, ensure uh, uh, additional control sometimes. Uh, so uh, that's one of the, the takeaways here. So um, thank you. Thank you, Luis and Rafael, for approaching this topic. But before we move on to the next one, I'd like to ask uh, our hacker and application security analyst, Jose Moreira. Um, so Jose, as a hacker, do you think that uh, on-prem solutions could have more vulnerabilities from an attacker's uh, perspective? Hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that um, the on-prem could, could have more uh, vulnerabilities because the, the software uh, will be the same, but uh, it will depend how often you, you do the, the updates in your own um, infrastructure. Um, of course, if you are on the cloud, the things are free. Um, you also don't need to um, to, um, to spend time configuring um, your own services because they, they will be managed um, by, by the cloud. Um, but um, if, if you don't have um, regular updates, there could arise some vulnerabilities. And um, other things that, that we should look at, it's, uh, for example, if it's um, a service that you don't need to, to have exposed, so you can have it internally um, without access to the internet, and then it will can be more contained. While it could have some vulnerabilities, the, the, uh, it will not expose uh, such as a um, higher risk as having a, a service, a public service. Um, but um, the, the vulnerabilities um, are there. And um, if we have um, this kind of services inside our company, um, for example, um, there could be another connection um, inside the, um, the network that could get you to, to that service. And for example, uh, if an attacker gains a remote code execution to that machine that is in, inside your infrastructure, then the attacker will be right away inside your infrastructure. While on the other end, um, if it's a cloud and if there is such a bug that an attacker could gain um, a remote code execution, as an uh, example, um, it will not affect your own internal infrastructure, only that cloud, but of course the impact will be even higher because it will not affect, affect just you, but also 
the other companies that, that, are, that are using that service. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, uh, actually. Uh, it's always about the segmentation, right, on the internal network as well of that component. So we could have a similar situation if even if it was on-prem. But me as a hacker as well, I, I, I definitely I agree with you on, on, on that on that on that perspective as well. Um, and especially, but but I I, I see uh, when I when I analyze uh, something um, in on-prem uh, uh, third parties, um, they they tend to be more outdated a lot of times, and that could have CVEs that can be exploited, common vulnerability and exposures. Um, that are common vulnerabilities affecting the software. So as a one last question for you um, yeah, regarding this topic, what software components or operating system uh, do you think it's more usually more vulnerable that you have come across uh, along your career? Like what, what was the, the, the most common CVE, let's say, that you uh, exploited um, while... Uh, doing ethical hacking and pen testing and so on. I, I will go for the, um, the example that it's more public on that matter. And I would say that's the um, using um, external uh, dependencies. Uh, it could be um, a JavaScript that you import from any other website. It could be something that will do some um, designs on your app or even um, collect um, analytics and something like that. And if that CDN or if that um, third party uh, gets act, then you also be act. And there are some examples uh, of websites that started to, to mine um, bitcoins. And of, of course, that's not um, supposed to, to happen. And uh, the worst part of, on that example is that the company um, had nothing to, to, to do with it. it. It was a third party that was totally outside of its control, but suddenly it appeared inside um, their product. Uh, so that's one of the, the main points in the, um, in the web subject. But there are also some other examples when uh, we are developing, because sometimes um, we find some library on the internet that does exactly what we need and we import um, that library but we don't have control of that code. And if we just update it with, without uh, looking at, at the code, firstly, we should look at the code before in, in importing that library, if it's an open source library, um, as my example, um, but also look at updates if, um, and see if um, there is something malicious uh, in there. And we have examples. The last one, it was with Node, Python, can't remember, but it's always um, happening. And suddenly you are uh, bumping your project and you are bumping um, your um, library versions. And suddenly you have a backdoor on your code without you even knowing. That's right. That's that's an interesting perspective as well in terms of the the, the components. Luis, uh, I was uh, looking at your camera as well. Uh, do you do you have anything to add to to this this part of discussion, or can we move on to the next topic? Yeah, uh, I came I, for my vision. I think that the Microsoft stack and essential the outdated uh, Microsoft stack. So it's a problem. I think that nowadays the biggest problem in the companies it's the Active Directory. Uh, the major attacks that we saw in the different companies uh, in Portugal or, or in Europe or in the world uh, are, um, in the end, uh, the, the impact was uh, huge because the, the vulnerabilities that Active Directory can expose uh, or the different services that integrate on Active Directory. And I think that we don't have the, 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 the right concern about the ring fence, about uh, what is the perimeter of security about uh, uh, on an active directory. And we have a lot of uh, supply chain providers and tools that integrate in these um, pieces of software. And uh, we are um, escalating the risk in the companies with these solutions. Um, so when we are discussing, I saw Jose goes 
for the, the software that is developed, I, I'm looking more for infrastructure and the, the risks that this type of solutions brings to the companies. Yeah, um, that, that's a, a good point. Um, sorry, I was forgetting what I was uh, to say. Can you repeat <laughs> your last phrase because uh, I was focused on that. Um, Sorry, just forget. Well, uh, what was no, your last phrase? Uh, no. Which, which? No, no, I'm saying that the the, the active oh, directory. Yeah, the active directory. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, I remember. It's because uh, since in your own company you cannot uh, totally control your your third party, uh, and that that's a, a question that uh, I have for both of you. Um, do you think that you can rely on contracts and NTAs, uh, for example, if that third party um, has a vulnerability, um, has a, um, a security risk or some thing, um, some malicious actor, gain some um, privileges there and uh, um, extract some, some information. Do you think that you can pass the responsibility to the, um, to the third party? If you, um, I, I can give you an answer for that because we, we, we made that exercise when, when we started to analyze um, a, a third party contractor um, and we discuss how much will be the, the, the clause of compensation if, uh, if, if they make uh, some mistake in the, the, the work. And the, somebody says, you need to remember that you are a company that um, each year uh, has a revenue of 6B. Um, so you are so huge for the size of the usual companies in Portugal that nobody can have insurance or something like that can support and pay you the risk that uh, maybe they are doing for you. Uh, so I think that we have a problem that, on that component. Uh, so maybe the providers are so small for us or not, or on the other side they can be they can support us. So we, the contracts, it's not enough. The compensation clauses on the contracts are not enough. So we need to have technical controls and mitigations to um, manage these type of risks. Thank you. I'm loving uh, that Jose is starting to ask questions as well. This is a great dynamic. Uh, before we move on, Rafael, do you want to add anything to this topic, the third parties? and vulnerabilities and so on feel free before we move on yeah this this active directory thing it's uh, really interesting because when we are using cloud environment like uh, uh, on, on azure uh, it's quite easy to lose lose the control of your uh, environment because you are dealing with a thousand of resource users groups and uh, every time you need to improve your uh, active monitoring because uh, if you don't manage privilege access or, or uh, password rules uh, to factor authentication and uh, the uh, role-based access control, uh, you I didn't experience any uh, data threat uh, yet regarding that but we already uh, saw some uh, wrong uh, actions inside the organization that we need to, to manage it and improve uh, our active monitoring because it can, uh, uh, as soon as we can control it internally, it's good. But if uh, someone outside the organization or, or a non-ethical hack, hacker uh, get this information, uh, you, we can have problem. Yeah, to to add up, I'm I'm not a huge fan of Active Directory. Uh, I am a, I am a huge fan when I'm hacking Active Directory. So, I think that we all agree on on these potential problems. Um, but yeah, uh, let's move on uh, to another topic, which is the external security providers. Um, so, managed security service providers uh, (MSSPs) are becoming more um, and more used by, by organizations uh, today. 
as they, they, they are a comprehensive solution uh, uh, with a range of security services that they can offer to the, the organization. So those include from defensive to offensive uh, 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 services, uh, consulting, compliance, uh, and more. Uh, so um, we are lacking resources in the market right now, and this is something that we are probably feeling on your organizations as, as well. Um, and I know this even me in the in the masters in the University of Porto. I feel like the students just go to work uh, and they, they are going to work to other countries, for example. And we we cannot retain talent um, in in Portugal uh, to have good in house expertise. So this actually contributes to uh, to to internationally even even internationally to have uh, more uh, re more companies relying on on external security. Uh, providers. Um, so uh, these uh, outsourced uh, security solutions are becoming more uh, uh, a standard. It's not that they are actually replacing uh, uh, internal teams, especially on large organizations, uh, but they are becoming more standard to improve the security posture uh, in organizations. So, um, uh, Luis, um, do you see uh, any risks associated with outsourcing security solutions, uh, like outsourcing your operations to MSSPs, uh, only a part of it, all of it. Uh, what are your what's your takeaway on 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 this? Your perspective on on this? Yeah, uh, I, we have some risks that are identified. <clears throat> Of course, the, the the companies have challenges in this sector. Um, it's not easy to to internalize all the security, cybersecurity stack, have specialists in all the areas, cover all the fields, and still have people uh, being the Cristiano Ronaldo of, of this type of thing. So it's not easy to have this inside of the company. So we need to have um, contractors, uh, third parties, uh, working with us in this area. What is the central challenge for us? It's to identify the good companies, the companies that are doing the good work. And uh, this is a, a, a challenge not, not only for the companies, but for example, for the country. I think that Portugal need to have a policy about that. We need to identify, to have a good evaluation of what are the companies that are good and have something that say mm, this type of providers are not so good or don't have the skills levels that they are saying that is necessary or that they are saying that I have. Um, in my experience um, about this, I, I'm, I'm seeing in the market some companies doing things, for example, using outdated frameworks. It's, how I can accept an uh, external audit uh, with um, non um signs saying that we are not uh, being aligned with the framework. They are using an outdated uh, version of that uh, framework. Um, uh, so Luis, uh, this leads me to another question uh, that we're, you were approaching, which is how do you select your provider? Uh, yeah. well, how do you establish these security requirements for the external provider? Uh, we are developing a new program for do that, and um, I'm, I'm in for this part of the challenges of um, security. I'm thinking that the companies need to have some way to get good reference for the partners that uh, will be helping us. Uh, and how we can get this type of references, for example, uh, having information about uh, uh, external and public events that uh, for in pen testing area people are doing and we can have levels of expertise that are public reviews by, by, by peers. Um, we need to have some way to, to identify this um, this type of good companies. Um, other option that we are discussing, for example, is to start to, to for some uh, areas, uh, have a requirement that the companies need to be certified 
not only by international uh, standards, but for the national um, seals uh, of National Cybersecurity Center. Uh, it can be one way for consulting, for, for example, SOC operations teams. For pen testing, I'm, I'm, I'm looking more for um, external indicators that can be review, reviewed by peers. Yeah, the, now that you talk, Cybersecurity Center of Portugal uh, is doing a great job on and moving on, on on this on this path as well in order to to perform this type of um, let's say uh, vetting these 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 providers. So that's that's a good move for our country as well. Um, uh, Rafael, um, going back to the first question, but on your perspective, which is, uh, do you see any risks uh, associated with uh, externalizing your uh, security and what are the disadvantages or advantages uh, from your perspective and I'd like to ask as well if you lack resources in house or not so what what's what's your approach to to this topic yeah well uh regarding the risks yes we have some risks here but uh the, the most difficult part is to select these uh, partners uh, regarding security because we have some uh, new partners in the market, we have old partners in the market and they have different approaches. We have some big partners, but uh, sometimes they are really, really expensive for some organizations. And they, uh, uh, as Luis said, uh, sometimes they are using old frameworks and some things that you don't understand why they are offering security uh, uh, consulting, and, but they are using uh, strange and old uh, approaches. Uh, for us, uh, yes, for, for the company uh, as Mixmove, uh, looking to these partners, it's really important. We don't have a hundred or thousand uh, uh, employees at the company, and to grow, uh, we need to select the, the right partners uh, regarding security because uh, we don't have any of these uh, knowledge people uh, in place. And well, uh, I I believe uh, depending of the area of the security like network infrastructure or even uh, active monitoring or security monitoring as uh, pain testing. Uh, we need to, to look at the market. Uh, we have some uh, tech radars to, to, to go to the market and understand the, the, the companies, but we don't have a recipe to that yet. Uh, we, we are in trying to build it that's a that's a good move already, and you're starting to take security very seriously, which is very important, especially on your on your industry. Um, yeah. So to close the topic, um, Jose, uh, I would like to ask you. Um, let's put it like this: uh, Would it be easier for you to hack a company that uh, is starting on security? Uh, it would be easier to hack the company or let's say to find vulnerabilities in the company if it started by relying on an external provider or by the company having, let's say, a couple of people in their first internal security team. What, what, what's your, your view on this? Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> that's a complex topic. Um, hiring uh, MSSP, uh, it's it's not going to, to do any kind of miracles. So um, first of all, you always you should always take a look um, at your code to, to prevent vulnerabilities um, in the first place. But since you are relying in, in a MSSP, um, they should have way more knowledge from that they, they got from other clients and other situations that they can uh, transpose that to, um, to your own company and bring you a um, high level of security maturity. Um, but sometimes um, the vulnerabilities are, are there. Um, 
MSSPs um, sometimes cannot uh, cover all the um, all the company scope, so um, there always ca can be some kind of, of vulnerabilities. And on the, on the so on the other side, um, if you have your own um, security team in in your company, um, it could be a little bit more difficult to to develop good practices practices and security of scope if you don't have um, many members to to do the 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 work and in those kind of situations uh, there could arise some vulnerabilities because you cannot uh, get to to every um, of them um, but um, since you are on your own company um, you have some leverage because uh, you know how your own company works and you have uh, way more direct contact with your own teams. And on those situations, uh, even if you have some kind of vulnerabilities, um, you, you could fix them uh, way quicker because you have the leverage of the, the internal knowledge. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I just feel that uh, companies uh, that have no budget nowadays to, you know, hire a couple, an extra uh, uh, member to the team um, and they don't do anything about security, uh, relying on an external service to identify at least the, the vulnerabilities that they have exposed usually uh, uh, a good a good approach uh, right um, so for, for a company that is starting of course I think in in my opinion both approaches are are definitely uh, necessary to bring an attacker's external perspective view and external knowledge and expertise as well but also uh, having the, the the right internal resources uh, but we have we are having like like I said in the beginning we are having uh, um, a problem in the market in terms of, of human resources, the qualified human resources that all our companies and all our organizations need to 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 win this 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 race, right? Um, that that we are all uh, 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 this this war, I'll say that we are we are all battling. Um, yeah. So uh, sorry. And that's why I think that they are not totally exclusive because you can have um, an inside team and also have some uh, external services. And for example, if you are a, a small company and you're still trying to, to grow at the times that you have uh, more maturity and, um, and the skills and the money to, to increase um, your own um, security, you can decrease the, um, the services from the, the MSSPs. But of course, I think like it's always good to, to have both of them because even for um, pen tests, uh, which will be the, the more generic um, test that could, could be done, uh, it always uh, it's always good to, to have an external auditor looking at our um, own code and infrastructure because um, we as a inside uh, members of the company, we get the old vision and we already know by hand uh, what we are looking for. And having someone from outside could have a, a new eyes uh, on the scope and find more things that um, usually an internal team could find. Yeah, 100%. Luis, you want to add something here? Yes, yes because I agree with this opinion and I want to give you the vision that um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is to have the, the best partner for each action that we need to do in this ecosystem of um, protecting a company. Um, I, 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 what I'm seeing is it's difficult to have one partner that is good for everything in the company. It's good for consulting service. It's good for SOC operations. It's good for pen testing. No, I need to have a, a, a diversity of partners. This is different. It's di difficult to sell internally because, oh, you are managing different teams, different people, but give you a, a good uh, ecosystem to exchange ideas, to test different opinions, and uh, focus on this part that is testing vulnerabilities, testing uh, weakness in your systems. Uh, I agree with Jose. We need to have different persons, different visions, different ideas, uh, testing the things. Because if you are always making tests with the same, the same company, the, with the same team, 
always making the same type of scans, the same type of assets, you are losing the the big picture of the company and uh, your attack surface, it's, it's being still exposed. So we need to have an ecosystem that can bring to, to you uh, balance between, uh, like we say, checks and balances. We need to trust and very but verify things like that in the, our uh, security approach. Super, super interesting. Uh, Rafael, you want to, to add something here? No, no. Uh, uh, I like this. Uh, Louis said uh, was uh, it's pretty uh, that I think about it because uh, it's important to to have a, a, an outside view of your posture, uh, and it's really important. Uh, I believe if you have just uh, an internal team, sometimes this team will uh, will not. Uh, doing the the work uh as the a fresh uh person inside the organization uh this is it's really different uh even we when you are developing some code uh if we test this the code that we developed uh, sometimes we'll uh lost something uh, uh in the security perspective it's the same Okay, so I think that we are all aligned and we all agree on on this on this on this topic. Um, all right, so moving on to the last topic, which is ethical hacking, and ethical hacking is 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 a way for companies to uh, stay ahead of the attackers uh, sometimes by identifying vulnerabilities. Um, uh, a lot of companies have been buying defensive security, they are buying firewalls, and I'm pretty sure that on your companies, we, you have that as well, of course. You have EVRs that work very well and the other solutions, but there are companies that only rely on defensive security and they don't actually care or they are afraid of bringing the offensive security side of things to the organization. I'm not just saying externally, but also internally, uh, because they are afraid uh, of doing this uh, sometimes. Um, so, um, but we are seeing that as cybercrime becomes more, becomes more lethal and more uh, unpredictable, um, there is a growing shift uh, in having well-defined policies to report vulnerabilities, pen testing, bug bounty programs, offensive security, uh, and bring the attacker's perspective, either with internal teams or external providers. Uh, so there's this race to stay ahead of the attackers, and ethical hacker can help to, to identify these, these uh, vulnerabilities and reduce the risk of, of exploitation. Uh, so uh, I'd like to start again with Luis, as usually, with usual. Um, how hard is it to make decision makers to increase their budget uh, for offensive security uh, or to even trust ethical hackers to uh, be playing as attackers doing a critical job in, this, in the times that we live on? Okay, this is, this is a challenge. And I, I have the experience of work in the public sector and the private sector, and I saw the difference of mindsets of the, the sea level of each of these type of organizations. Um, let's see. Uh, the, I think that the first problem is the word hacker. When you say we will contract a hacker, everybody uh, have a threat of that because we are uh, contracting a, a, a bad actor. Uh, it, 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 I think it's, it's, it's uh, um, something like that, uh, that that don't help us um, on the uh, first of all. The second is the question that everybody uh, wants to buy technology that solves all the problems. So you sell the idea uh, that everybody can buy a scanner that will identify all the vulnerabilities. And uh, this is something that is in the, the minds of the people. Why I need to contract services if I can bought a, a, a software that will find everything that has a nice dashboard with light of uh, high and critical things. And um, I think that is the uh, uh, a mission 
for the people that is managing this type of um, responsibilities of the companies that need to educate the the the, the decision level the, the 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 managers of the companies that there are differences and uh, bringing the attack the attacker's perspective to the defense can help us to identify and anticipate um, some points that the traditional and by the book uh, rules maybe can uh, fail. The other things that we are doing or mindset that, that I'm sharing is that this uh, human verification is the checks, is the moment that you are verifying if the everything that you apply it by the policies, by the technologies, and everything is working like we expected. It's, a, it's the test, like you make um, drills for the fires uh, and things like that. We make drills for uh, the, the IT solutions. If for that, we use ethical hackers. Um, I, I think that we need to work a lot in Portugal about this awareness. Uh, for example, it's almost prohibit to talk about bug bounties. If you say this word in the company, everybody start looks to you uh, saying what, what crazy word you are saying. Um, when we are talking about responsible disclosure, everybody says, why? And, and I think that it's a problem because our law saying that the, the, the test of a vulnerability, it's a crime. So there is a mindset that we will punish everybody. The, the long arm of the law will capture all the guys that are doing these things that we know is not true. We need to work with the people that know how to make the attacks to, to better defend and to persecute to the attackers that really are doing the, the, um, the bad things in this uh, cyberspace. Yeah, we have a lot to do. I, I uh, I'm not sure if you have seen the the the, the news in uh, in Belgium uh, in terms of responsible disclosure. That was a huge step for 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 them, and I hope that we can get there uh, soon as well. Yes, but let me bring. I think that we need to work in the the national strategy for the cybersecurity that we'll be discussing this month in Portugal. Uh, we need to put these topics in the agenda. We need to change the way uh, of these things are being discussed and uh, what is being shared. Uh, uh, for example, I, I, I'm using this sentence. I, the Portuguese software houses are so good. How many CVs you know about um, Portuguese software? There are no vulnerabilities disclosure, for example. You have a lot of softwares that uh, covers hospitals, municipalities, things like that, and nobody's disclosure the vulnerabilities about the software. Yeah, that's, we need to that's do something a, about that. Yeah, that's something that scares me a lot, and our our mission in the in the Hattiac is actually to to help those um, to identify vulnerabilities on on those components as well. That's that's something that we we care a lot about and that's something that we want to prevent from happening because um, this, in terms of making decision makers uh, understand this, this problem, it's sometimes hard to, to wake them up for, for this topic. It's, it's um, because we know that it will happen. Uh, we just don't know when and we need to be ready and have the, a strategy to, to be able to respond uh, effectively and contain the attacks as well so um there's a lot to do uh, especially as a country as well uh, in terms of responsible disclosure and that's something that that we are working on as well um rafael uh in your case uh how hard do you find uh to uh, increase budget for security in general um or was it hard for mix move to trust ethical hackers to to, to identify vulnerabilities on your organization or was it a smooth process in your case? 
honestly, I was quite lucky in that case because it was uh, in a period that we are building some disaster recovery exercise regarding our infrastructure and platform. And I uh, compare these two uh, behaviors. Like we are attacking our infrastructure to broke it and recover it. We should do it uh, regarding our security as well. And our CTO was really open to, to help me uh, with the management team to increase uh, our budget to security tools, not just to security tools, security partners and security training for the team. And it was, uh, yes, I, I was really lucky because I, I, I got help in the first uh, uh, try. Perfect. That's that's good to hear that there are some some easier situations that happen in uh, in some companies and that allow us to to do our jobs uh, correctly and how it should be. Um, all right. So uh, some final questions to to Jose. Um, so Jose, when you are uh, approaching a target as a security researcher as an ethical hacker. Uh, where do you usually focus uh, first to, let's say, to find a vulnerability, the first vulnerability? Uh, what, what's your methodology to, to approach that as an ethical hacker? Um, first, we need to, to know what's, um, this, um, what's the, the big price on, on that company. Um, for example, if it is... Um, the data of the clients that they own, if it's the, the infrastructure, if it's some kind of improper um, intellectual property, um, we should first uh, know what we want to, to get uh, as a higher price and then um, point for that. <laughs> and um, in those processes, um, always um, think outside the box and think how you could convert um, sometimes some types of vulnerabilities that um, could leverage, leverage you um, some more accesses, um, some more privileges um, in, in the way that we could get um, inside the company or inside the data and exfiltrate the, the data. So we could um, prove a point that um, an attacker could, could also do, do the same. And there is always someone uh, better better than, than us. So if I'm able to do this, so you can um, picture what someone with more knowledge can can, can even do. Um, so yeah, that's um, the focus, always um, touch where it hurts. Yeah, I agree. I, in my methodology, I usually go to the core of the target, let's say the core application, find the most complex feature and just try to understand where it could break somehow. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely a good approach to, to find a vulnerability. Um, another question would be, uh, what, like in, in terms, we were talking about defensive security. So as a hacker that has a lot of headaches, uh, as I can assume with the web application firewalls, um, do you think that web application firewalls in general can be easily bypassed or not really these days? Uh, once you bypass it once, then all of them will be easy. So um, the worst part is just finding the, the bypass and from there um, you, you're free to, to test uh, your vulnerabilities. Um, of course, for a first level, for an entry point on security, um, at least uh, it could slow down um, an attacker, but it's just like um, a lock that you, you could use on, on your bike. Um, you could, can use it, uh, maybe it's going to be secure and um, other, other attackers will not be interested in, in that one because they know that they have some security, but it's not um, enough, it's not 100% secure and bad, bad things can happen. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to add that uh, there, we can cannot have a bypass sometimes today, but there could be one tomorrow, right? And yeah. and that's something that we need to be paying attention as organizations 
uh, as well, right? Yeah. There's um, always people with more knowledge than you. And some people also share some vulnerabilities that do not share with the rest of the world. So yeah, things can happen. Yeah. Okay, and one last final question for you uh, about ethical hacking. Uh, so what was the most critical vulnerability that you ever found? So I think that the public is always curious to see uh, what was the most critical vulnerability that we, we hackers ever found. Uh, so without obviously disclosing information uh, related with the targets, uh, responsibly, can you describe uh, the story behind the, the critical, the most critical vulnerability that you ever found? Uh, yeah, uh, of course, I think like uh, Luis and Rafael will uh, maybe identify with this one, but uh, of course, um, leverage code execution on the um, Active Directory, it's like the, the holy grail of an uh, internal audit. And times to times, um, it's not easy to, to get there. Um, I think like my rate would be 100% uh, uh, of success getting to um, to admin. Um, but the, the funniest part of, of that is um, cooperating uh, with your colleagues and share the, the knowledge and um, bringing up um, each other vulnerabilities and fitting them together so you can construct a chain and you get to the holy grail that would be the active directory. So that would be the, the most interesting, um, the most interesting vulnerability. But of course, the, there are other types um, of vulnerabilities um, in the web context. So it will be um, gaining some kind of remote code execution also. Uh, but on, the, on this kind of scopes, uh, for me, uh, the more, most interesting, interesting bugs will be access to sensitive data. Um, that's always good when you, you can get to, um, to passwords, even if they, they are um, hashed. Um, and yeah, extracting um, information can also hurt, um, hurt for the, um, the company. So it's always interesting to, um, to find them. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, that was great. Active Directory, of course. It's, it's, <laughs> it's challenging, but when it breaks, it's, it breaks. I, I definitely agree. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's close the, the round table by one. I have one last question for you before we move on to the Q&A. So people watching, feel free to drop a few more questions. We have some here already that we will be showing in a bit, but I wanted to uh, close it up. Uh, I would like to ask, if you would say in 30 seconds, each one of you, what could organizations do right now do to stay more safe nowadays with the rise of cybercrime, um, especially medium to large organizations? What would you say? And feel free to add anything that you want uh, extra if you want. Um, yeah, so let's start with, the, you know, who, Luis, uh, as usual, and then we'll move on to Rafael and then Jose to close it up. Okay, thank you, Andre. Let me be quick. I think that the first thing is to improve the capabilities to response, to detect and respond to incidents and mitigate. Uh, I think that we need to go to an alert level that uh, you first stop the, the threat. You need to have the empowerment to block a connection to stop a server, to stop the network in some place of the business uh, before uh, a, a threat can uh, uh, target your, your full organization. I think that is the, the first mindset. The, the, the second is test. Verify your attack surface, detect your weakness points, um, Good, make a good analysis and continuous analysis about your uh, posture, essential in the external uh, view of your organization. And this is very essential if you are using cloud services because it's more difficult. There are different challenges. So these are my, my two points for this moment. Awesome. Rafael, go ahead. Yeah, for me, uh, th this one. Uh, 
how to respond for an incident, it's uh, the most important. You need to, to, to stop it uh, as, as soon as possible. And uh, the second one, it's uh, active monitoring. This is uh, really, really important to, to try to prevent uh, some uh, different behaviors on your infrastructure or in your code or on your systems. Uh, uh, Audinti, uh, they are really important uh, things uh, to uh, be the first one uh, to know what happened on your infrastructure or on your platform. Uh, and the active monitoring uh, is the, the most important thing for me when I'm talking about uh, uh, security and operations. Great, thank you, Rafael. Jose. Um, what do you have to say? Yeah, um, just trust the, the ethical hackers. Uh, we like to, to exploit things, but of course we, know, we are not, we are not um, malicious um, and we can point how to exploit the vulnerabilities, but we can also point how to mitigate, mitigate them because we know how attackers used to, to do it. So we can also give you um, good recommendations to, to fix it. Yes, I, I agree. We need uh, we need to have more organizations to understand what we do. It's not black magic. It's it's way different than that. And yeah, we were talking about demystifying the this word. And yeah, I I hackers, in my opinion, like we we are here to help people and organizations. We are hackers. We are not crackers. We don't do this for the money or to leverage our power uh, with the the weak. Right, so and for our own profit, so that's not us. That's that's cracking, right? And that's something that we are doing here. Um, all right, so let's move on to the questions. Uh, we have a couple of questions in here. Uh, so uh, regarding, let's get, get, go back to the on-prem versus cloud. Uh, when choosing what to keep on-prem and on the cloud, does that data classification take a strong word? Uh, you can see the question here. Uh, anyone wants to go ahead and give a take on on this? I'll assume that it's basically about um, when when Jose in the in the chat uh, from the participants said this is meaning uh, classifying the the the. the security level of data, right? The, the, the confidentiality of data. Yeah. So, Luis, you want to go ahead? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I can bring a view of a company that is a, that have a strategy to go to the cloud. So for us, it's the same to have the information um, or have a, a data classification uh, with a label, with a high level of sensibility that information can go to the cloud. What what we need to do is to have the uh, adequate uh, controls to protect that information that is stored by uh, a third party. Um, and of course, uh, the challenge that we uh, discussed early, there are all in the table. There are a lot of different technical controls that we need to, to address. There are um, compliance controls that you need to, to add to the contracts and things like that. Um, and uh, we need to, to manage that. I think that the cloud nowadays, it's inevitable. The companies are going to there and they cannot uh, fight against this, uh, this, this type of things. So we need to, to adequate our risk to, um, to this type of challenges. Thank you, Luis. I'm not sure if you, Jose or Rafael, if you want to, to add anything to, to this uh, point, feel free if you want. Okay, so let's, uh, we are running out of time to the final part of this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, let's pick another of the questions, for example, the last one. Um, does a strategy for security should include upcoming trends as a vector of threat, uh, as been predicting these, these trends? Uh, so being one step ahead and aware of the ever-changing landscape, uh, what you guys recommend? So what do you recommend to be be able to predict these upcoming trends 
as as vectors for for our organizations. Uh, so who wants to maybe Rafael or José, one of you want to to add to to answer yeah. this? Yeah, maybe if if you are a bit ahead, you can gain some leverage and, and be uh, prepared. But of of course, we never know how the the attack is go is going to be. So um, we could not have totally uh, sure if that prevention will be effective. Um, so yeah, it's always good to to have that kind of of. Um, of prevention, but doesn't do not rely only on, on that. All right, uh, we have one live question that just dropped. Uh, Umberto Luis uh, is asking: Should also uh, the company scanning the infrastructure for hacking commands inside of the network? Yeah, I would say that that is also part of um, the mitigations when we find um, a vulnerability that is uh, following following up that vulnerability and check if it has already been exploited by other uh, attackers. Um, so at, at least you can understand if there, there was already any kind of compromise and what have been compromised. All right, and maybe one last, uh, uh, there was actually in the beginning, um, what SCA tools do you recommend? Um, anyone wants to to answer this one? And from this, uh, I think that there's missing an M, it's scanning tools, or is it the supply chain security related tools? Um, I believe oh, um, uh, yeah. software composition analysis. Uh, yeah, yeah. I it's, like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I recall it's a it's static analysis based tools. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rafael, you want to go ahead with this one? Yeah, sneak. It's a good tool uh, to to uh, go to your uh, libraries and check it uh, if everything is updated. You have uh, any no uh, vulnerability, but yeah, this is a good one, but you have a, a, quite a lot of uh, at the market uh, doing the same. Uh, the Panda Boot can be one of uh, this type of two. It's not specifically that, but uh, do the same of Sneak like. Yeah, that makes sense. Sneaks, uh, sneak helps a lot as well, so that's definitely good recommendation for for that uh all right so i think that we can close the q a part of this and uh, i would like as the moderator to thank you all for for coming as well and to to be able to uh, have this this discussion this open discussion here uh with uh, every uh, single one of you so thank you so much uh for for coming it was it was a great pleasure so uh right now uh we'll uh have we're going to bring george here george you're back uh yeah thank you so much uh guys i think it was really really amazing uh i have been listening to you all and there are some nice questions also in the in the comments i think we can close this session this round table i want to Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Rafael, Jose, and Luis uh, for the, the amazing knowledge. And feel free, everyone, to follow us on, on ETIAC, on the social media. Uh, to close, I have some announcements to do. Uh, so uh, bear with me for some slides, and then we can close the session. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about ETIAC. For the ones that are not uh, uh, familiar with ETIAC, what we do, we do basically prevention. We do that by doing autonomous ethical hacking, as we call it. And basically, the idea is exactly how can we protect and how can we prevent uh, cyber attacks to happen on digital systems. And here, the main problem, and we talked about this in this in this. In this roundtable, is basically that we are in the middle of an era that is digital, and we work online, we work agile, we push code every day, and we work remotely, and this makes our infrastructures really big. And if we talk about supply chain that exponentially grows, 
And this is, makes most of our infrastructure exposed attack surface and known. And that is a big problem that enterprises have. And we try to do that by scanning all the infrastructure and understanding how what is exposed to the to the to the to the online, right? And that allows us to manage our tax surface easily. Uh, the main problem, and we talked about this, I, I took that takeaway also from this webinar, is that we need more testing, right? And the problem with testing is that mostly we can do it or either pen testing or bug bounties, uh, which is the forbidden word, as we said, here in Portugal. Uh, but basically the problem with this solution is that they are very expensive and usually they are not frequent enough, right? So we do like one pen test a year. Uh, and the problem with scanning is scanning is still very noisy. So we have mostly 45% of false positives uh, in today's scanners. And basically security analysts, they get a little bit lost in all these vulnerabilities that are identified by scanners. And that's where ETIAC comes in. So basically the autonomous ethical hacking is not only automatic, right? For us, we differentiate automatic with autonomous. And what we do here is that we developed uh, some artificial hacking. So that is way more than a scanner and we will see uh, in a minute. But the idea is we can do attack surface management and testing continuously to the exposed as a black box testing and to exposed uh, assets that are on the, on the internet. Uh, and then we also have ethical hacking, which can go in depth on the digital infrastructures and that complements artificial hacking. So instead of us doing a pen test per year, we can do multiple pen tests every year uh, and the hackers can focus exactly on the vulnerabilities that the machines didn't find, which improves a lot the accuracy um, of the, the, the scanner and also the continuity of the testing, right? And the idea is how we learn with the ethical hackers every day for our machines. So I'm not going to be very specific here, but the idea of artificial hacking is that we are much more than a scanner. So basically we identify vulnerabilities with a low false positive rate. Uh, we have less than 1% in our automatic solution. Uh, and we can do that because we use proof of vulnerability. We also have technology that allow us to do, understand what changes in your infrastructure. So we are not always overcharging your infrastructure. We understand and we scan it as it, it grows or as it changes. Uh, and we have advanced security testing modules in our automatic. We also have a concept that we call instant knowledge propagation and that only what we believe is that everyone needs to be protected in a collaborative way so if we all, all of our clients and users they benefit each other because if we find a vulnerability in one of them we automatically will test in the other ones and that's what is instant knowledge propagation then we have ethical hacking and that you know uh, um, it's basically with hackers like Jose Moreira, like Andre, like other that they are on our crowd. And here we use a crowd of ethical hackers, such as bug, bounters, bug bounty hunters. But um, the idea here is that it's a mix between pen test and bug bounty. And we do vetting on these uh, hackers. The, what allow us is that we allow us to get skills from worldwide, which is not possible with internal teams. That's something that we also discussed here in this round table. Uh, this allow us to be, the testing is the most creative and logic because the machine already found most of the CVEs and most of the basic vulnerabilities that we can find. So we can really go in depth with the human hacking hours. Uh, and um, we have really good talent hackers that have discovered vulnerabilities in big organizations, right? So the idea here is we have two plans. We have machine and symbiotic. The machine is, you can get already secure with only the artificial hacking, but you can also work with us on the symbiotic plan, which you have a bank of hours that you can use to launch multiple pen tests every day, and you can launch pen tests in days, okay? So um, 
if you want to know more, you can, you can reach out to me. I will show you. But the idea is exactly that. We do in our at the portal, we do tax surface management and vulnerability identification. And you can see here a report submitted by our automatic um, part, uh, we call Genesis, the first artificial hacker. And every technical report comes with steps to reproduce, description, impact, and also suggested mitigations, how to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Um, I'm not going to go uh, in depth because the idea here was not to talk about ETHIAC. Uh, we have some businesses that already trust us, um, such as Mixmove and Sonai and uh, others. But uh, the idea here that I want to announce you is that we are launching in May the new version of the product. And I wanted to let you know all of our viewers that we are launching this, this new version of the product. It will be completely new, uh, the UI UX interface. And you will have, you can have a, a view here that is supposed to be confidential yet, but I just put it here for you to uh, see how our user interface is completely new. You will have the machine hacking and you have the dif different pen tests and you also have a risk score. And we'll have also uh, the, severity of vulnerabilities and you can classify assets according to their their importance which will give you like this risk score based on the severity of the vulnerabilities in the assets that you are being identified so uh, we are basically opening uh, this sign up for the new portal so if you want to try the old version you can sign up uh, on portal at yak.com if you want to test the the be a better better user you can also contact me this is my email here um yeah we are going to to announce this soon so just follow us and we'll keep you posted and thank you so much for coming to this to this uh, um, round table we are at yak um once more thank you for all of the panelists that come here today see you guys soon uh bye bye